Well, the subject of the, today's discussion is one that I think is fascinating and dear to everyone's heart, the uh, relationship between men and women. And to discuss that, we have to go back to the beginning. And um, as you can tell from this young man, he's uh, falling in love with his mother. And um, little boys love their mothers, and mothers love their little boys. Um, of course, little girls love their mothers as well, but because today's topic is about men and women, um, we're going to discuss the relationship between mothers and their sons and vice versa. You would think that the love that a son has for his mother would carry over into a lifelong affection for the feminine and for women in particular, but unfortunately uh, no such carryover exists. Uh, the global world society is shot through with misogyny and patriarchy and uh, it's difficult to understand why. Uh, if every little boy starts out loving his mother, why does it change? And, um, you know, is it a question of, as Freud pointed out, that men have to reject their mothers to become men? Or does it have to do with uh, muscle mass and testosterone? Or perhaps uh, it's a cultural thing, as some people propose, and that we should start dressing little boys in pink and little girls in blue. Uh, this morning, I would like to uh, present an, uh, an alternative theory that has to do with sociobiology, evolutionary theory. And um, I wrote an earlier book entitled The Alphabet Versus the Goddess uh, because I was intrigued by this whole question. And it came up on a, uh, on a wonderful trip that I took with Barry and his group to Greece many years ago. And in that trip, it became apparent to me that there was a indisputable evidence that in the ancient world both men and women worship goddesses. That's not open for dispute. Uh, women can perform major sacraments. Uh, it was uh, that way in Japan and China and in India and in Mesopotamia, in Egypt and Rome and Greece. And men worship goddesses. So um, then there was a period of about 3,000 years where the gods took over and then pretty soon uh, there was only one god and he was uh, indisputably male, and particularly in the West, uh, the three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, um, all rejected the notion that there was such a thing as a goddess. So as a result, um, I asked the question, what event in culture could have been so immense and so pervasive that it changed the sex of God? So um, you, know, you have to understand that I bring a different perspective to this rather than an anthropologist or a historian. And that is that my background is, is that for many years I did vascular surgery and operated on the carotid arteries to the brain and have long been fascinated by the very different functions before, between the right and left hemispheres of the brain. And as you all know, the left hemisphere of the brain is the, your language lobe and it's uh, wired for linear sequential processes. I was also very interested in the ideas of Marsha McLuhan, the 1960s media theorist, who said the medium is the message, that the process by which we take out information and put, in, put out information and take in information is more important than the content of the information. So with that information uh, on both those fields, I came up with a rather unusual theory in that the disappearance of the goddess was due to the invention of the alphabet, uh, and that alphabet literacy uh, was the culprit uh, that actually did women in. Uh, the thug who mugged the goddess was an inside job. Um, so, and that, that has to do with the fact of uh, the way our neurons work. You know, right now the mantra in neurocognitive theory it goes like this. Neurons that fire together, wire together. Meaning that a child that learns something, those neurons are reinforced. And it's something that they don't learn, those neurons are pruned later and they die back. So what is the effect on a young child's eye of aiming a machine gun at them at about five years old and firing in a steady stream of numbers and letters, numbers and letters, numbers and letters for the next uh, 15, 20 years. And I believe that what that does is that reinforces the left hemisphere of the brain. And the left hemisphere is the masculine side of both men and women who are right-handed. And the right hemisphere is the feminine side of both men and women who are right-handed. So that the cultures that are derived from um, alphabet literacy cultures tend to be very masculine. How did we go from ancient times when men and women worshipped women to a time when they only worshipped a vengeful and wrathful God? 
Uh, that's the way Yahweh started out. Of course, nowadays he's quite loving and forgiving, but that's not his uh, MO in the old days. Um, but I had a problem, although that book became a bestseller, I realized I had not completely answered the question because it's clear that there are many uh, preliterate cultures in, in which men mistreat women, and I couldn't blame the whole thing on literacy. So I've written a new book to explore this. Uh, entitled Sex, Time, and Power. And to understand this, we have to go back to an evolutionary whodunit, the greatest mystery unsolved to this point. We now know that the human species arose 150,000 years ago, give or take 10,000 years on either side. We know this from molecular biology and we know it from paleontology. And for the first 110,000 years, there wasn't a whole lot happening. I mean, we invented some slightly better tools. We moved out of Africa and then populated all the various areas in the world. And then, 40,000 years ago, an unexplained, mysterious thing happened when suddenly the human species began to create significant cultural markers that have come to signify every single human culture. We began to consistently bury our dead, produce grave goods, have extensive rituals, sophisticated art self-adornment, and began creating art. So the question is, what happened? I mean, we didn't increase our brain size, we didn't change our physical stature, we're exactly the same pre-110,000 um, years ago to after 43,000 years ago. And it, this is called, by the way, the creative explosion or the upper Paleolithic revolution. So there are some that po posit that perhaps this was due to a massive brain uh, mutation, but I uh, think that it was something else. I think that we learned something. So the question is, what insight could humans have had that would have been so fantastic that it turned the lights on in their brain, that it changed us as a species? So the answer that I have to that is that I think that a critical mass of humans discovered that they were going to die. You know, five-year-olds are very sophisticated. They speak a very clear language. They put their sentences together. They know that on their birthday, they're going to have another birthday. They don't know they're going to die. It takes it to about age seven when children finally get it, you know, that not only when the, with the death of a grandparent and the death of a parent, that they themselves are doomed. And learning that you're going to die is a gender specific, it, it shows a very interesting gender difference because men are more frightened to die than women are. When Dylan Thomas wrote Rage, Rage Against the Dying of the Light, do not go into that dark, do not go gently into that dark night. He's talking principally about men. And I base this on my experience as a surgeon of 35 years. I've operated on a lot of people and had to tell them after an operation they have a fatal terminal illness. And across the board, in all age groups, men take this news much harder than women. Men want more radical surgery, they want more radical chemotherapy, they want more radical radiation therapy, they don't want to die. Now there are many exceptions to this rule. I've, presided over the uh, termination of many uh, very brave women who fought very tenaciously and also very gracious and courageous men that went uh, and understood they were going to die. But in general, men are more frightened of dying than women are. They have a different attitude towards it. I think it has to do with the fact that women are closer to the cycles of the earth and, the, uh, and their own rhythms of their body, which men are not. If you ask women to draw you a metaphor for time, they'll draw you a circle. If you ask men to draw you a metaphor for time, they'll draw you an arrow. Arrows have beginnings and ends, and circles don't. In the, uh, <clears throat> when the Huntington's Korea, when we discovered the gene for Huntington's Korea, which is this terrible disease that afflicts families, you don't know you have it until you get the disease in your 30s and you die a terrible death. The geneticists went to the families and they said, we can tell you whether you've got this terrible disease. All you have to do is take this test. Very interesting results. Women took the test three times more often than the men did. And you don't have to go to, the, to that, you can go to the AIDS epidemic because in the early stages of the AIDS epidemic when there was no cure uh, or no treatment, the women who were white middle class women were all rushing to take this test to find out if they were carriers when the men who were practicing uh, very unsafe lifestyles were not interested in knowing whether they had the disease or not. Now, other animals um, know death because they see it all around them, 
but with the possible exception of an elephant, there is no other animal's be observable behavior during their lifetime that indicates that they are aware that at some future date, they're going to die. So humans began to experience something that the other animals didn't. We began to experience existential despair. Other animals experienced fear, but we started to have anxiety. Now, a new thing came out of this, and that was that shamans began to invent religions. And the religions are based on the notion of a yearning that humans have when they found out they're going to die, that they really didn't want to die. They wanted to believe that they're going someplace else. So the new religions popped up, uh, and every religion differs from a philosophy in that a religion has a story about what happens to you after you die as opposed to a philosophy. Now, these stories were about the Isle of the Dead, or reincarnation, or the land of the dead, or Hades, or Valhalla, or here's Paradise, here's the first installment of the 70 virgins, um, uh, or Avalon, um, or the Happy Hunting Ground. Now, it was the brilliance of the Christian patriarchs to come up with the idea that there were actually two places that you could go. One was heaven and one was hell, thus bringing into existence the greatest method of thought control uh, ever uh, promulgated by any system of thought. Now, the thing that all these phantasmagorias have in common is that they have a story about what happens to you after you die. Now, once humans realized that we're all going to die, you could no longer leave your friend where, you, where he died in the field because you had to do something with his body to make sure that he had it with him to go to this next world. So as a result, these extensive, uh, enormous burial mounds, the largest structures that humans have ever created in the ancient world were to house the dead. And of course, accompanying that, once we've shuffled off that mortal coil, it was perfectly appropriate to make um, perfectly good grave goods and put them in the grave so that that person should have them for their journey to the next world. Many of the ancient rulers killed their slaves to have them with them. Um, the, the Indians practiced sati where the wife had to get on her husband's funeral pyre, pyre at his death because he wanted to have her in the next world. And of course, the many thousands of clay soldiers we've unearthed in China speaks to the universality of this urge to have companions with us when we die. Extensive rituals accompanied this notion of dying, and ritual, mortuary rituals, became a defining characteristic of every single culture in the world. There is no culture that does not have an extensive ritual after somebody dies. Now, a universal myth arose, and that is that a, a, a sacred sacrifice, an anointed chosen one, was sacrificed that was killed, and then his flesh was eaten, and the blood was drank. The most common totem animal that was used for this in the ancient times was a bear. Bear cults existed throughout all the ancient times. They would take a captured live specimen, stake him to a, the ground. Each person would come to the edge of the leash and whisper to the bear what the terrible sins that they had committed during the year. And then after everybody was finished, they danced around the bear, the music stopped, they fell on the bear, they killed the bear, and then all of them ate the bear and drank the blood. They were all participants in this. Um, this scapegoat concept um, became transferred to the lamb. It's a, it's a very common notion. Uh, Prometheus, Dionysius, uh, the confessional, communion, wafer, uh, the um, um, Yom Kippur are all bleached relics of this once riveting rite. So Jesus came to represent the lamb and of course, he died so that all the rest of us would be able to enjoy eternal life. And the payoff was the notion of resurrection. Thank you. Now, the most enigmatic activity that began after 40,000 years ago was this extraordinary outpouring of prehistoric art. Light years ahead of the scratchings on bones and stones that preceded these uh, pictures, for some reason, humans began, had an irresistible urge 
uh, for unfathomable reasons to begin creating absolutely spectacular art. The art before the 40,000 year creative explosion is almost non-existence. Afterwards, you, it's hard to find a human culture that did not create art. Now the interesting question that arises is what are the motives that would cause people to begin to create art? And one of them is the sense of immortality. You know, when you, there's a cave in Garges in France that has thousands of handprints all over the walls and it's 30,000 years old and you can't help but feel when you see these handprints left by people 30,000 years old that at some measure they wanted you to see this handprint and think of them. You know, what was it Emily Dickinson said, when, when this you read, think of me. The poet Horace bespeaks to this sense of immortality that we have when we create art that we know will live on beyond us. Now, art has been in existence uh, for 40,000 years. Every single culture has created art. So the question is, why did we just start creating art 40,000 years ago? Why not when we became as a species 150,000 years ago? What took us so long? And why did we start making it? Now, this brings us back to the question of misogyny and patriarchy. Um, you see, men, after they had this insight that they were going to die, had a secondary insight which convulsed relations between men and women. You see, men are separated by nine months from insemination and birth. And somewhere, sometime, some man figured out that the woman who he had sex with nine months earlier was having his child. And still grieving over the fact that he was doomed to die, these two insights about sex and death crisscrossed in his brain, leading to an extraordinary new third insight, the concept of paternity. And when men realized that they could cheat death a little bit, if they knew who their children were, then the men became very interested in knowing who their children were. They realized that they could name their children. And naming is a magical act that confers on the namer, a, 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 and it puts on the named an obligation to the namer. So the men wanted to know who their children were. But here's the problem. When Athena appears to o a Telemachus at the end of Odysseus's, and she says, are you the son of Odysseus? And Telemachus replies, who knows? <laughs> so there's not a doubt in any woman's mind as to who her children are because they come right through her. But a man never knows for sure. Now I believe that men and women used to have sex just like the animals until men figured out the concept of death and paternity. And then they had to establish an entirely new relationship with women, otherwise they weren't going to know who their children were. Now, of course, they were bigger and stronger so they could rape the women, but that would never solve the problem because if all the men raped, then the men still wouldn't know who was, uh, wh whose child was whose. So, and besides, if you didn't help and stay to help raise this child, the likelihood it would survive uh, was diminished, and furthermore, a child had to know and love their father if they were going to honor him after he died. So as a result, the men tried to construct patriarchal societies in which they restricted women's reproductive rights, or they enslaved them, or they repressed them, all for the purpose of being able to know for sure who their children are. Remember that property is a legacy. And legacy is all about lineage. And leaving a lineage is all about immortality. But the men underwent a neural makeover that allowed them to begin to love women. And men made an astonishing discovery that they needed a woman to complete themselves as a human being. That intimacy made them less selfish and less narcissistic more creative and emotionally enriched. So the men um, 
discovered that women had a much better idea than in slavery or harems. And besides, women had a power that I'll discuss in a few moments that brought men to their knees. So the women encouraged the men to willingly enter into a semi-permanent relationship called marriage. And of course the women benefited from marriage, but let us not lose sight of the fact that the main reason of marriage that men enter into it is to legitimize their, their heirs in the eyes of their peers. Once the men fell in love with their mates, they then fell in love with their children. And an amazing thing happened. The men discovered what women always knew, that their heart was held hostage by their children. A man learned that he could only be as happy as his unhappiest child. Entwining a man's legs with little children softened him, made him less aggressive, made him a more loving human being. Men began to teach their children the, the lessons that they had learned in their life. There is no other non-human male that expends time or energy teaching its offspring anything. There are surely fathers among non-human males, but the concept of fatherhood is unknown to any of them. Now, men were eager to sign up for this new adventure called creating a family. By proving their potency and their masculinity to women, I mean to the rest of the people, and the men also gained in stature because they could show that a woman was pleased enough not to stray. Men want more children than women do in all cultures in the world. The first thing that happens when you give women the choice is they reduce the size of their families. But a man's stature rose in the eyes of his fellow man with the, uh, with the rise of uh, families. The question I want to pose this morning is, how did men figure out this concept of death and paternity? How did they gain the foresight to be able to see that far ahead? And of course, foresight is the ultimate weapon of mass destruction. We humans, are smarter than any other animal, and therefore we are making them all extinct. They are not making us extinct. You cannot ask a dog to make an appointment with you in two weeks. He, he won't keep it, okay? These lions are not thinking about what they're gonna do next Tuesday. That is not on their mind. You cannot ask this frog what his plans are for tomorrow because he doesn't know. In fact, this frog can't even remember what he had for lunch yesterday. So if foresight was the most effective weapon of mass destruction that allowed us to put all the other animals in our zoos, why is it it only occurred once in all of evolutionary history? I mean, when natural selection worked out the aerodynamics of a wing, they released into the air thousands of species of birds that strum and fly and glide. So why is it that there are no horse seers or prescient hippos or clairvoyant llamas? Now, in order to understand this, we have to go back to the savanna to visit an unusual catastrophe that befell our species at its very outset. Every sensible land animal moves on four legs. For some inexplicable reason, we stood up and started walking heel to toe. Nobody knows why. Here, three and a half million years ago, a, a, a hominid that was upright walked through some volcanic ash at Laetoli and left these footprints. These are three and a half million years old. So we know that somebody was walking heel to toe back then. This is what the uh, artist thinks we looked like then. Now, anthropologist Owen Lovejoy said, for any quadruped to get up on its hind legs in order to run is an insane thing to do. It's plain ridiculous. If you took any man in this audience and you took his clothes off and parachuted him into the middle of the savanna, how long would he last? I mean, he would be cat food in no time flat, you know? <laughs> what prey could he run after and catch and kill? So it's not at all clear why we stood up, but after a while we figured out that our two hands were free, and they could brandish a weapon that a big mind could imagine. 
However, standing up disadvantaged women mightily. And the problem begins with this bone and these bones. Because when you stand up, your pelvis has to assume a different architectural function. It has to serve as a bowl to hold this massive intestines that's now sitting directly above your anus. I mean, all the birds and the mammals and the reptiles, they move like this, we move like this. So what this means is that we are at risk for being turned inside out after going up for a stroll after a particularly heavy lunch. <laughs> this is not a gravitational hazard that exists for any other animal. So that means that the hole in the pelvis had to be very small. Meanwhile, the human brain, for some other reason that nobody knows why, underwent this hyperinflation routine that had gained a whole pound of brain tissue in 400,000 years, which is just a blink in the evolutionary eye. So now we had this enormously big brain <clears throat> sitting above this enormously small <clears throat> opening in the pelvis. <clears throat> this is a problem. <laughs> How is that little critter going to get out? The human baby's head was too big, causing women to have a lot of difficulty in delivering their young. There was no way that you could not get that baby through that little opening without causing significant stress to the mother. Here we have a gorilla pelvis and a 200 pound gorilla delivers a three pound infant. A seven pound, uh, rather a hundred pound human delivers a seven pound infant. This is a problem. So natural selection did all these sleights of hand to thread the baby through the eye of the mother's needle of her pelvis, but still women began to have increasing problems in childbirth and then a catastrophe occurred. Here you have um, Medea, uh, who had this to say about childbirth. So the paradox is that the single greatest cause of death for human females is childbirth. If you check the tombstones in any cemetery prior to the 20th century, you'll notice the extraordinary dates suggesting women died at a very early age, and most of them died trying to give birth. If you were the engineer who designed the species, and you were knocking off your healthy young females in, in, in their first delivery, this is what it would look like. You would be fired from your job. You would never be allowed to design another species. That would be you'd be sent home. <laughs> now, you would think that we would have gone the way of the dinosaurs, the saber-toothed tigers. You would have thought that natural selection would have gone back to making wider-hipped and effectually waddling women or smaller brain babies, but that's not what happened. Women continued to have large baby headed babies and continued to have trouble in childbirth. The human female was under a stress that the human male wasn't. She is the one that passed through an evolutionary bottleneck. So if the human female had to acquire enough mental cognition to figure out the connection between sex and pregnancy, if she was going to die because she had sex, she needed to understand the connection. You know, there's all these millions of animals that are screwing her brains out, and I don't think that any of them have the slightest idea what the purpose of this activity is for. But some woman somewhere said, Oh, I get it. This kicking in my belly is the result of that transient moment of pleasure I had with that guy over there. And then they realize that they have risked their lives to have sex. And if they survive childhood, childbirth, they are also aware they are going to have to put out an enormous amount of energy raising this offspring. Because for humans, Children are forever. <laughs> there is no other species that if one of its offspring were to call it at 2 a.m. in the morning, 25 years after the date of birth, and say, come, help me, you know, that they will drop everything and go to the aid of their offspring. I mean, elks won't do that, horses won't do that, cows won't do that, only humans. So, women gained foresight. 
they had to understand the concept of months. But that wasn't enough, because once they figured it out, they needed a power that no female of any other species ever had. So the human female gained the power to refuse sex when she's ovulating. Every guy here knows that changed everything, okay? <laughs> because all the other females, when they're in their period of estrus or heat or rutting, their hormones are driving them to mate. The human female acquires something that philosophers call free will. <laughs> the ability to choose a course of action different from what their hormones are calling to do. So the Genesis story about, you know, that Eve took, gained ego consciousness and then had to suffer this terrible punishment for committing original sin, which is to die in childbirth, it's backwards. The stimulus was childbirth mortality rate. And women didn't commit original sin, they exercised original choice. The first, you know, women think that the pill was the most liberating uh, historical event, but the truth is that what really happened is that women gained the power to d exert discipline over the sexual process. And the first woman who was able to refuse some male that tried to mount her must have mumbled in the proto-language available at the time, free at last, <laughs> free at last. <laughs> Humans mate in a way different, totally different from any other animal. Now, they were aided by the fact that the males are undergoing an opposite change in the other direction that was quite extraordinary. A human male entering um, puberty has a 20 to 40 time rise in testosterone. Testosterone um, concentrates a man's mind singularly, okay? <laughs> a young male's thoughts of sexual fantasies are omnipresent and his nights spill forth enormously erotic dreams and his brain is soaking in a cranial tub laced with testosterone. <laughs> so, the human male, this is what the human male is always thinking about. Now the human female, in contrast, has a three times rise in estrogen, and although estrogen isn't entirely analogous to testosterone, nevertheless, it's, um, it just speaks to how much more adult young boys are with uh, sex than young girls are. And then, of course, this is, there is extraordinary um, mistiming of libido. Um, here we have the young males who go crazy in the early years of their adolescence, and then it slowly wanes, sort of like the uh, smile on the Cheshire cat in Alice in Wonderland, you know, all that's left is a feral leer, you know. And of course the women have their peak in their mid-30s. Who set this up? I mean, you know, I mean, it, the men and women are always out of sync. I've, I've, I've sort of figured that maybe they're going to get together in the nursing home when all they really are interested in is, is a good bowel movement, you know. I mean, maybe, maybe this is, maybe, maybe he was onto something. Maybe he was onto something. Now, non-human males are not interested in females who aren't in estrus or heat or rutting season. A stallion that would think to approach the, a mare and try to mount her, he, she'd be kick him in the cojones, and that would be the end of him. The human male develops this careening, out of control sex drive that he wants sex all the time. Now, women are well aware of the fact that it takes an enormous amount of blood to give a man an erection. So they know that a man has one brain and one penis and only enough blood supply to operate one at a time. <laughs> so here you have men that have this aberrant sex drive that some men want to have sex with dead women, old women, menstruating women, pubescent boys, little girls, intakes on vacuum cleaners, uh, other species far removed from other, from humans. By the way, the beasts do not practice bestiality. So the human male was confronted with a dilemma. He went up to the first female and he said, 
<laughs> Come on, baby, let's do it. And she said, mm, you smell bad, you're ugly, you're stupid, we're not doing it. <laughs> and he was confounded because no male of any other species has ever confronted a female with a mind of her own. And he asked the question that really starts the human species, which is, what does a woman want? Which really means, what do I have to do to get her to say yes to sex? If you were to install microphones in the middle school boys' locker room and listen to what they're talking about, you know, what, what all boys are talking about at that age is, well, what do you have to say? What do you have to dress? What do you have to do? What's the secret to getting a girl to say yes? And the answer to what a woman wants is in my book. My publisher, my publisher said, don't you dare tell them. We're going to take back your advance, make them buy the book. But the men had to figure out the answer because if they didn't, they death awaited their genes. Like Oedipus. I mean, they had, in order for a man to pass on his genes, he had to get a woman to say yes. The problem was, is that most men are clueless as to what a woman really wants. So how did the women acquire foresight? So here we have an entirely new female, something new under the sun. And the, you know, the way other animals mate, this is the way they do it. There's an olfactory alert, okay? The males know that the females are ready when they're like this, okay? If a man tried that, he'd get summarily kneed in the groin immediately, okay? So, the males come from miles around, they fight among each other, and the biggest and the strongest get the mate, even the bunnies, even the bunnies do it. I mean, you know, this is uh, not just the, the big tough guys. And then, of course, some males strut their stuff, and some males dance till they drop, and some sing their heart out, you know. But, but all males understand that females are a scarce resource and they're gonna have to win the fight in order to get the girl. But once they do, the female puts up very little resistance and uh, I love this photograph. It sort of looks like she's saying, oh, I forgot to turn off the gas. <laughs> so my question is, if it works so well for so many millions of years, for so many millions of species, why did we humans abandon this system? Why is it that we mate in a way totally different from the other animals? We, these two guys are competing for this woman, but they, they do not have a clue as to what phase in her menstrual cycle she is in. <laughs> Women do not give off a signal. In fact, they have something called concealed ovulation. In fact, women themselves often do not know when they're ovulating and they have to go to Walgreens and buy a thermometer or a cervical density mucus kit because they don't know. So you could say that women lost estrus. Estrus is the seasonal thing that happens to primates of which we are one where the females go nuts for sex. It's usually the females that solicit the males. The average chimpanzee has 138 uh, males for every one baby she births and they're the ones that solicit. So you could say that the women either lost estrus or the women are in a continuous state of estrus, but humans do it very differently. Now the argument is, is that, well, they had, to do, they had to lose estrus in order to pair bond with men to help them raise children. But there are a lot of monogamous mammalian species like gibbons and perivoles and wolves and albatrosses that th they mate for life and they don't need to lose, the female doesn't lead to, need to lose her season. Another feature of the human female that's very different from all the other animals is the extraordinary amount of blood loss that she experiences as a result of menses. There are 4,000 species of mammals. 3,999 of them pump out litters of eight and 10 and 12 piglets, cubs, kits. They don't lose any blood or very little if they do. The human female loses more blood more often than any other species. Wouldn't we all agree that blood's a pretty vital substance to a mammal? So what would be the point of a human contemporary female losing, on average, 40 quarts of blood over her lifetime? Now, admittedly, ancestral women had less menstrual cycles 
but even still, that's still a significant amount of blood loss. Plus the fact that once we came down from the trees, we, the women were sitting ducks for predators because they used an olfactory sense to find prey. Men can shimmy up trees better than women, and women caring for small children would be at great risk. So here this anthropologist said, this is the mystery. There is no known reason why human females menstruate. If it's detrimental, what's it doing in the genome? It, must, it has to have a positive offset, otherwise it would have been culled out by natural selection a long time ago. Another unusual feature is that women, when they associate in close-knit close -knit groups, begin to harmonize their menses. <clears throat> they all start to bleed together. Now this is a feature that's very strange because the conductor orchestrating this harmony is a 81 quintillion ton inert object, 250,000 miles out in space. The moon is the metronome that sets the tines of all the women's ovaries around the world and their dark pelvises um, 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 beating in order to release that egg. Now humans uh, have circadian rhythms like all other animals. Most animal circadian rhythms have to do primarily with breeding. Um, but the human female lost estrus, which is the main circadian rhythm, and the only circadian rhythm she has left is menses. Now, if you were trying to teach an animal how to tell time, what you'd need is some external mark outside in the outside environment and then train that with an internal event that's incredibly dramatic. So the external markers are a day, which is too short, or a year, which is too long, or a season, which is too indeterminate. But by God, a moon is just right. A month is just perfect. Now this is the length of the menstrual cycles of the other um, primates that menstruate. And you'll notice that they're all over the place. The human menstrual cycle on average, and this was done by examining 40,000 women's menstrual cycles over a 10 year period, the average was 29.51 days. Is this a coincidence? How could that be an astronomical coincidence? that it just so happens to be exactly equal to a lunar month. Now we live at a time of artificial light which has greatly attenuated this whole process, but in the ancient time, women were sitting around in the dark when this big white object wasn't in the sky and they were bleeding. And eventually, one woman finally got the pattern. She said, look at this, girls. Last month, next month, it's the same. So the concept of a month occurred to a woman, and she then pole vaulted herself into the future and was able to make the connection between nine months and pregnancy. The English language, the word moon, month, menses, and measurement are all the same. The word calendar comes from calendari in Latin, where the priestess announced the arrival of the new moon. Ramadan and Rosh Hashanah are still based on the new moon. The Islamists put a crescent moon on their flags because prior to uh, Islam, they worshiped a moon goddess. This is the word for menses in all the foreign languages. This is its equivalent in English. It means the same thing. It means measurement. So the human female grasp the concept of time. And when she did that, she was able to separate herself from all the other animals that went before her. So I believe that these extraordinary adaptations in the human female, which are so different from other animal, are not there for reproductive purposes. They don't have anything to do with sex. They have to do with women understanding the concept of time. There's another arithmetical coincidence, and that has to do with uh, pregnancy. You know, obstetricians today ask a woman when her last missed period was, and they count that as day one. But if you count the pregnancy beginning from the first full moon after a missed pregnancy, which is the way all the midwives do it, amazing. A human pregnancy 
is 265.80 days, nine lunar months are 265 points. There is no other animal that has a multiple of lunar months equal to their pregnancy. So women bled on the dark of the moon and they birthed their babies on the full moon. I think that the changes in the human female were so great that we should have named our species gynosapiens rather than homo sapiens. <laughs> Gyna is the uh, Greek root for woman, and uh, as in gynecology. So in summary, the women gained the concept of time, which came about because they, they were dying in childbirth and the men weren't. And they needed to understand the co connection between sex and pregnancy. The men were at a great disadvantage because they were, all they wanted was to have sex all the time with all women all year long. And since the women could exert discipline over their, um, their um, sexual drive, they gained an enormous power over men. And this then is the root of misogyny because the men experienced enormous frustration over the hoops that they had to jump through in order to get a woman to say yes. The veto power over sex is the source of a woman's power and it becomes the root of his anger. In addition to which, the men also realized that the women controlled their legacy. Their sense of immortality, the woman had the power because it was her that controlled her eggs. So the men conspired to build patriarchal societies that robbed women of reproductive choices. And the men needed to do this in order to be able to sure, be sure that their heirs would continue their name. Now, we humans, if you ask philosophers what distinguishes humans more than anything else, they'll tell you, well, you know, we have, we're this, we're that. They have all these different traits. But isn't it interesting that the one thing that they don't mention is that the humans are capable of loving each other greater than any other species. And that's because both men and women overlap. Every man in this audience has a feminine side, and every woman in this audience has a masculine side. And these are combined within each of us that allow us to interrelate in a way that allow us to love each other, to mate with each other and care for each other and grieve for each other. And these, this love that we have between us is something that separates us from the other animals. It allows us <clears throat> to pair bond, to be able to bring forth children, to raise them in a safe environment, so that they can live long enough to reproduce. <coughs> so, we now live in a world where a lot is changing. Women rarely die in childbirth anymore. In all the conditions that I once said were the status of our ancestral Homo sapiens and Gynosapiens, we now live in a world that has such technology that it's changing us as a species. And I believe that the people at a conference like this are the leading edge of a change in the relationship between men and women because I think that we're metamorphosing into a different kind of species. And it's not the typical kind of evolutionary change where we get a bigger brain or a longer limb or a better hand. The changes are occurring at a transcendent level and that will continue uh, into the future. I hope this presentation has uh, stimulated you to think of sexual relations <laughs> in a better manner. Thank you very much.